Okay, so to pick up where I left off, uh, basically, um, what you'll what you'll notice is that um, you know you can just like with the last name, you can get an idea you have a common ancestor, depending on how unique the last name is and how rare it is. Uh, <laughs> as a percentage of the population, and the same goes goes with a uh, coat of arms. You can't just look at a coat of arms and know exactly a, f a person's family tree all the time. And there are mistakes actually made, and Drake's going to point those out, or at least I will, where Drake won't admit it <laughs> in his um, in his writing here. Anyway, here's the a chapter on the heraldry, heraldry of the Chichesters, and he wrote this chapter in response to the contents of the history of the family. Of Chichester, ten thirty something A.D. It was written by Palmer Bruce Chichester. Anyway, so I just start here. And he says, before proceeding to examine and describe the various coats which the different branches of the Chichester family have borne in conjunction with the family arms, I propose to consider the accuracy of the statement made by the author of the history of the family of Chichester, who at page nineteen of the book, and this that book by the way is a is you can see, you can look on Google Books you can find it there. Uh, page nineteen of his book writes thus: From this this date, i.e., the marriage of John Chichester with Thomas C. Raleigh, the Chichesters drop their own arms and assume those of Raleigh. Now this myth is still floating about to this day. People still believe that. People that are at least have a pretty strong interest in Chichester uh, history. Still, hold on to that to this day. That's my side comment. To this day is 2010. This is written in 1887, I think. <laughs> okay. The writer had previously assumed that the ancient bearings of Chichester's were ermine, a canton sable. And I'll step back for a second and I'll say that that was actually the coat of arms granted to the Lord Mayor of London who happened to have the name Chichester, and it was granted to the position, I believe, of the Lloyd Mayor of London, not the individual. Solely on the ground, he says, as I understand, that Stowe refers to a coat of that blazon as having been, with the addition of the charge of the Canton, to the arms of John de Chichester, Mayor of London, who died 1381, but between whom and the Devonshire family, no connection is shown. Now, London is in Middlesex County. It's um, towards the south end of, of, of Britain, I believe. <laughs> England, I believe. Um, but it's still a good ways from Devonshire. I mean, you, yeah, certainly you can travel there. <laughs> Even on horseback with a reasonable amount of time back 1381, but... You know, what he's saying is he doesn't have any, he couldn't find any evidence himself of that same individual living in Devonshire County. And the Chichester is really uh, centered in Devon, Devonshire County at one point. Those are my comments. No authority whatsoever is given for this statement, the statement of the drop the arms, which it will be observed is not put as a matter of of conjecture but as positive fact. It occurred however to me that this assertion God this guy should have been a CPA was a reach off of the story that I heard before and according to Sir William Pohl's collections I found the alphabet of arms the following entries Sir Sester, Argent on a cantle sa sable, a cup Argent Chichester of Raleigh, Checky and her goals that she vary and under the same coat under Raleigh of Raleigh, with a reference from the last entry to the previous page, where in describing the monuments in Exeter Cathedral, Sir William mentions that two knights lie together, the one having his on his shield the arms of Bohun, with, and now I'm going to say, that why there is a thorn, the, and the other with the arms of Raleigh of Raleigh. The thorn, sound of a thorn is the like th vid cheque or and ghouls achieve very to this statement the note is appended by the editor of Pohl's book as follows these are now the arms of Chichester's whose ancestor married the heiress of Raleigh whereby the estate came to Chichester who probably took the arms of Raleigh 
Here then is justification for the suggestion, improved by the author of the history into a fact, about the change of arms as to which it would would have w been well, not only in this, but many very, very many instances I could point out, is the guiding maxim of the great antiquity of our country had been followed, viz. She set down my authority because if I have erred, I may manifest the ground thereof. <laughs> kind of like, kill me if I make a mistake. <laughs> a little nuts, but okay. The author, the subject of the Chichester Arms has been referred to my friend, Colonel Hard Harding of Upcote. An interesting paper read at the meeting the, of the Exeter Diocesan Arch Architectural Society in 1857 on the effigies and high tombs of Devon. Colonel Harding, Colonel Harding, according to the difference of opinion between Leland and Sir William Pole as to the effigy in Exeter Cathedral, the former ascribing it to a Chichester, while the latter, as seen above, describes it as a memorial of one of the Raleigh family added that the chief motive for ascribing it to the former appears to have proceeded from the shield having once borne what are at present and have been for many generations been the Chichester arms, unmindful perhaps that these arms were the, were the earliest bearings of the Raleigh's. Unfortunately, as I informed, all trace of the arms on the shield have disappeared, and it is impossible, therefore, to test by any present examination the accuracy of the statement as to what the code in fact was. I can find no authority in any of the early rules of arms for the statement that the Raleigh's at any time bore cheque and or goals at Chief Vare. The only entries I have met with are the following. Roll of Edward I, Monsieur de Raleigh, goals and Ubin de Vare, Crosseur de Argent, Edward II, Henry de Raleigh, Goals of Fess Vare, Goals Cressley or Ben Vare, and Simon de Raleigh, the Goals, and I don't know what that is. <laughs> Papworth, I don't know who that is either. It is true in his Ordinary of British Arm Rolls in page 556, gives a coat to John Raleigh, Cheque and Ragul achieve very as Argent, as he does so upon the authority of an ordinary of arms apparently compiled by Thomas Jenkins in 1607. It should, however, it should, however, be remarked that the same authority gives John Raleigh Port de Gaulle's Ben de Vere Crossley de Argent. Now the problem is, see, this is what this is what's happening. See, the Raleigh family has their own different coat of arms. The Chichesters have their own arms, and the question is whether a branch of the Raleigh family with their different coat of arms as I explained earlier, uh, died out, and that coat of arms becoming the Chichesters, or was it the Chichesters? And it's confusing because the Lord Mayor of London had a different coat of arms. As against Mr. Thomas Jenkins, I may place that of a far better authority, Robert Glover, like as in Glover's pedigree. Somerset Her Herald, in the reign of Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, who, previous to 1588, compiled an ordinary of arms, which has always been and still is much relied on by the officers of the College of Arms. And in that ordinary, there is no attribution of the arms now born to Chichester to any member of the Raleigh family. On the contrary, he gives the coat to Chichester, as does Joseph Holland, a Devonshire man, whose valuable manuscript collection of arms of the gentlemen of Devonshire compiled in 1579, 21 Elizabeth, will be found amongst the Harlan Manuscripts 1571, where he gives the respective arms of Chichester and Raleigh as then born and treats them as entirely separate coats. At the time Holland made his collection, Sir John Chichester's monument in Pilton Church, to which I shall presently refer, was in existence, and it will be seen that from the armorial bearings which ornament it, that at the same time the two coats were treated as distinct, a pretty conclusive, pretty conclusive evidence that the persons most interested in the question did not credit the change of coats suggested by Pohl and affirm for us fact in the history. So he, so he did some digging, he basically found out that there were, the Chichesters had those arms 
you know, back in the, at least the late 1500s. Now, the problem is, is that by uh, Drake's own work, he's come to the conclusion that, that John uh, Chichester, son of John Chichester and Thomas C. de Raleigh, was born in the 1300s. Yeah. <laughs> Most Chichesters can, can trace their, their genealogy to the 1300s, and that's damn well good enough to my, my opinion. You know, just who, uh, you know, we even know who Thomas C. Raleigh's parents were. We don't necessarily know who the John Chichester's dad was. We don't have any documentation for that. But that that's pretty damn good. That's 700 years ago. <laughs> you know, we don't need to go back to the beginning of to the year 1000 as the history of the family Chichester wants to do. Um... Now, I will say that when I did look at it, and I'm going to stop for a second here, when I did look at it, and getting back to my whole discussion about um, record quality, is it audit, is it review, is it compilation quality, I, my opinion is it's just about review quality. Uh, History, Family, Chichester, that part of the pedigree he's talking about. And that part are the ancestors of um, John Chichester, who married Thomasia Raleigh, and the ancestors of Thomasia Raleigh, uh, daughter of, of John de Raleigh. Um, I, from the little evidence that I have, granted, um, you know, there seems to be a line of individuals that go from one person to the other that. I can't say that I have evidence to contradict it, but I can't say that I have evidence to support it either. So that's what I call review quality. That's very well possible that that is a correct line, but it's also very well possible it could be absolutely flawed, as Drake says. You know, Drake's standard is audit standard, and I I, I will say here that after I've looked over Drake's work, um, I would say that he's very, very close to audit quality work. Very, very high quality work. He's probably one of the best, gene best genealogists of the um, 19th century. Uh, I will say that. So then he goes into, basically, I'll go into some of the descriptions, and I'll talk about what visitations are when I start my next one.